Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Anything that move, I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. Go. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown! You're listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right of the week, and we're talking about the Eagles' new defensive coordinator today as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 312. At the top of this week's show, we've got Scouting Report, where I chat with Ben Fennell about the 2020 Indianapolis Colts defense. We watched a short set of clips from that team this fall, all of their turnovers from the season, and we've got some takeaways on what we saw from the Colts' takeaways. Not only was this one of the top defenses in the NFL last year, but it's also where the new Eagles defensive coordinator, Jonathan Gannon, comes from. He was the defensive back coach there the last three seasons. So uh, we'll see how some of the sausage was made uh, you know, with that defense and some of the things that we liked that we saw on film uh, over the 34 plays, I believe it was. So uh, it'll be a fun discussion here coming up with Ben at the top of the show. Before we get there, though, a couple things I want to make sure we hit on. First up. If you've got a request for a player or a scheme or a team that you want us to break down, the best way to do it is to go over to our Apple Podcast page, leave us a rating, leave us a comment, and you request in that comment, we will definitely hit on that request. And even if you don't want to give us a request, it's the number one way to throw us your support. So if you've got a question, if you've got a suggestion, if you want to tell me you lo- love the show or you hate my guts, whatever it is, head on over to our Apple Podcast page, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. Also, if you enjoy my chats with Ben here on the show each and every week, then make sure you go subscribe to the Journey to the Draft podcast because not only do Ben and I talk about the top prospects in the country every single week over there, but we were also joined once a week by the great Greg Cosell. So if you enjoy my weekly convos with Greg here on the show during the fall, well, you're going to love what he brings to the table every single week now on the Journey to the Draft podcast. We'll be doing that every single week, twice a week, all the way. We do it all year round, but leading up to the 2021 NFL Draft, there is no better resource. That's the the show to go find. You can go subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. All right, enough about Journey. Let's get this show rolling. It's time now to dive into our chat with Ben Fennell in Scouting Report. Dim those lights. We're headed to the film room for the scouting report. All right, well, let's start talking about this Colts defense as I welcome in Ben Fennel. Ben, uh, this was a, uh, a fun team to go back and watch. The, the Colts finished tied for fifth in the NFL, 25 turnovers this past year in the 2020 season. Uh, we watched all of them, plus their turnovers on downs, uh, some of their safeties as well. Uh, this was a, a fun group to study. Well, yeah, it's just a little bit different in how they play defense, you know, comparatively to the rest of the NFL. You know, a lot of people want to, you know, uh, pride themselves on man coverage and exotic blitz schemes and a lot of confusion and rotation and, you know, uh, you know, exotic schemes to try to confuse offenses. This is a little bit different. This is very much a vanilla opportunistic type of defense that prides themselves on a lot of zone coverage and keeping it in front of you and not being the ones to make mistakes. So it's a really interesting kind of cat and mouse study on how defenses want to uh, attack opposing offenses. And this was a team that we did not, you know, for from an Eagles standpoint, we did not have a reason to watch this defense. They didn't have any crossover opponents. So uh, coming into this, was there a player or an aspect of the scheme that you were most excited to see when you turned the film on? Well, I just wanted to see. I know it was going to be a heavy zone coverage, uh, minimal blitz, nickel personnel. uh, But I just wanted to see how exotic those zone coverages were. If they were changing the picture pre and post snap. Um, if they had enough of those combo coverages and hybrid zone coverages within those uh, zone calls, like cover six and, you know, cover eight and some of those kind of split coverage stuff. And I just want to see how they were getting pressure on the quarterback. I knew Darius Leonard was incorporated to be a blitzer quite often, but this is a team that really doesn't blitz often. They like to rush with their front four, keep it in front of them on the back end. And there's a lot of good players on every level, whether it's Darius Leonard, Stewart and Buckner, Kenny Moore at nickel is probably one of the better defensive backs. It's not a household name, tough corners out there. And how about rookie Julian Blackman? Really fun player to study as well. So uh, no, there was a lot to kind of look at. And, you know, I've been joking for the past two, three years that Matt Everfluss has been cover twoing himself into head coaching jobs and his staff has gotten jobs all over the place. And it's really interesting in that it's kind of a, 
vanilla, boring defense, but it works. And it's just fun to kind of peel some layers back. Yeah, and he comes from uh, Rod Marinelli. He worked under him uh, with the Dallas Cowboys, and it's a, a lot of those same things that you would see from the really good Rod Marinelli teams over the you know the last decade plus. Uh, I think you do kind of see that with this Colts. And team. there's a lot of like Tony Dungy in Rod yeah. Marinelli, which yep. Dungy, for all intents and purposes, another boring defensive you know type of scheme guy. When you have really good players, you don't need to be exotic. You don't need to be creative and do all this crazy stuff. Go play zone keep it in front of you, let your dogs get after the quarterback and make plays when they come to you. And that's kind of the same, uh, you know, the same structure, whether it was Dungy, Marinelli, now here to Eberfluss and uh, Love, uh, Lovey Smith. Yeah. Lovey Smith. Same yeah. thing. Yep. yep. Same, Beautiful. Same yep. tree. Um, the, to me, the guy that I was most interested to kind of watch was uh, DeForest Buckner, you know, all pro defensive lineman. Uh, they trade the first round pick for him. I was just kind of interested to see uh, the impact that he had uh, on that defense and some of the things that they were able to do um, with him. So that was something I was certainly kind of keeping an eye towards. But there were a lot of other things, uh, as always, that I was kind of tracking as I was watching the film. But um, real quick, before we kind of get into our takeaways, let, let's get into the stats that matter. Was there a, a number or two going in or maybe coming out of it uh, that stood out to you? Yeah, a couple things. And these may surprise some fans. And it's kind of interesting. I talked about their heavy zone coverage. Yep. What are some of the issues with zone coverages? You tend to give up a lot of completions. Over the last two seasons, Fran, the Colts have allowed the worst completion percentage in the NFL. Hmm. Nearly 68%. But second fewest missed tackles in that same time period. So what does that mean? Limiting yards after catch. Limiting yards after contact. Very, very good tackling team. So while they allow a lot of completions, they tackle and rally to the football extremely well. And we'll talk about that in a little bit and what some of that rallying to the football creates. Um, Some of the other things about zone coverage, only allowed four explosive scrambles this past season. Their Mm -hmm. eyes are typically in the backfield, not allowing these mobile quarterbacks to take off on them. Um, Some other things, you know, while they do allow a lot of completions, they typically prevent the big plays. So this past year is 57 plays at 20 plus yards. That was 11th in the NFL. So how are big plays created in the NFL? Letting the ball over your head, coverage bus, miss tackling. Two of those things rarely happen with this Colts defense. So it's interesting to see how they limit those big plays. And the last thing for you, this team rarely blitzes. Second fewest blitz percentage in 2020 when they want to. Zone coverage, rush four. This is a boring, boring defense, Fran, but it works, and it's so fun to kind of study. So there were 34 plays in this cut-up, and I did share the the list of the plays that we watch uh, on my Twitter account, at EaglesXOs. You can go find that screen grab of the, the, the start of my notes, and you can see all the different plays. But there were 34 snaps, and after charting it, just going back and taking a look, all right, what were some of the things that I took a look at? Uh, nine of the 34 plays uh, had a blitz element where they added extra rushers, so uh, definitely a small percentage amount, a little bit higher than I think their normal blitz percentage, but that, go, you know, that, that comes into effect when you're talking about about, uh, their big plays defensively. You, you see a handful uh, came off the blitz. Much more stunts, you know, and we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. Nine out of 34 featured pre-snap disguise. And I mean, all I did for that, because there are a lot of ways you can disguise uh, when with your defense, I just looked at the, at, the, the, at the shell, the safety shell. If they started in one high, then shifted to two or the opposite, uh, then I put that down as a pre-snap disguise. Nine of those 34, which isn't a super, super high number, uh, but enough to keep you guessing as a, as an offense and as a quarterback for sure. And then obviously when it's a third and long, you might do a little bit less disguise. So, you know, those numbers can get uh, thwarted a little bit Uh, to me. There are a couple other ones here. Uh, 14 out of 34 snaps featured some kind of too high coverage. So, uh, you know, and to me, I I think there's a really interesting discussion when you talk about, um, you know, one high versus two high, obviously, when you play one high say, one high coverage, you've got that extra defender that's able to come up uh, and play closer to the box or uh, be used as a pass rusher in, you know, in, in some kind of a blitz or some kind of a pressure scheme. When you're playing too high, I mean, look, at the end of the day, you know, we talk about passing league, passing league, passing league. One way to protect yourself with that is to play a lot of too high, right? And, and you know, you're obviously you're through having both safeties back there, being able to assist in some way, shape, or form uh, with the cut, with the the corners on the outside and with the nickel in the slot. Uh, you know, so I think it's kind of interesting having that discussion of the benefits of one high versus the benefits of two high. Everybody uses both, obviously, and that this isn't like uh, you know exclusive one or the other. But I think when you look at just the uh, the percentages of two high. 
you know, a lot of the, the big defensive schemes this year that, you know, people were buzzing about Indianapolis. Uh, you look at the LA Rams, what Brandon Staley did out there. They did a lot of too high. Uh, you know, I think that you're, you're starting to see more teams be willing to say, okay, we're going to remove a player from the box. We're going to rely on our front to handle that, but we want to make sure that we're covering ourselves uh, on the back end. And then one more uh, that I kind of charted too. Um, obviously this is a heavy nickel defense, but then when I took the, uh, the turnovers on downs out, so all the fourth downs, 14 of the 24 big plays came on third down. So when you go third down against this team, you want to make sure you're third manageable because if it's third and long, they're going to find ways to mess with you, whether it was disguise, whether it was their, their stunts or their blitzes, and they're going to create some big plays. I thought they were a very timely defense uh, going back and watching. They came up a lot of big plays and some clutch moments. Yeah, absolutely. And I think timely, opportunistic, yeah. those types of words, I think are going to be, uh, be recurring in our conversation. All right, so I'll, I'll let you kick things off. Our first burning question here, I'm going to come to you first. Biggest takeaway from watching this cut up? You know, as I've already alluded to, the kind of lack of an exotic nature with this defense, and I'm going to kind of keep calling it vanilla just for lack of better words. But what I've written down here to sum it all up is, quote, we aren't going to screw up. You are. And I think sometimes defensively, when you just say, you know what? We're going to make you go 10 plays. We're going to make you go 80 yards. You're going to be the one to mess up, not us. And having that type of chess match um, is really interesting to think about. And so many defenses want to disguise and be exotic and throw wrenches at offenses and confuse them. And sometimes it's a, you know what, let's wait for you to mess up. And that's what I kind of, you know, uh, that was my opinion kind of watching these Colts turnovers and watching mm -hmm. a lot of the Colts this past year. Um, and even, you know, some of the other elite teams uh, around the NFL that played a lot of zone coverage, Tampa Bay bucks played a lot of zone coverage. Packers played a lot of zone coverage. A lot of these teams didn't allow explosive plays. They kept it in front, got after opposing quarterbacks and played the cat and mouse of saying, we're going to make a play before you do, or you're going to mess up before we do. Um, and I think that's a really good formula to being a good defense expectations of a dominant defense are gone for him. So we need to realign. What does it mean to be a quality defense? What does it mean to be a dominant defense prevent explosive plays and occasionally get an impact play? And that's the name of the game in the NFL right now. It is hard to play defense. So fans on Sundays are disappointed, you know, on every drive and maybe allowing completions on third down or giving up a 10, 12 play drive. We need to really refocus on what our expectations are to be a quality defense. And I think these teams, the Bucks, the Packers, the Colts are the new formula for being a safe defense and saying, you know what, let's wait for the offense to mess up before we mess up. You know, they, I think before we even continue this conversation, I'd love to get your thoughts just on the, the differences between man and zone from a plus and minus standpoint, because I think with our, you know, with fans, uh, you'll often hear things like, oh, well, you know, they play so much zone. Why don't they play more man or vice versa? Hey, they play so much man. We need to play more zone. If there was one perfect cover, we say this all the time. If there was one perfect coverage, every team would play it on every single mm -hmm. down. There's pluses and minuses to both. Um, I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts. How do you kind of view that, the differences uh, from a philosophical standpoint between heavy man coverage and heavy, heavy zone coverage? You know, we can go through the pros and cons on them. And, you know, that's a, always a good exercise. But what you had just said a moment ago is no defense covers everything. There's vulnerabilities in every defense. And fans need to understand that. And that offenses work all week and pay guys very, very well to find those vulnerabilities on a down to down, week to week basis. And offenses in the NFL are pretty good at doing it. So just when, you know, they're playing zone coverage and allow a completion underneath and you're wondering why aren't they pressing playing man, there's pros and cons in each. So I think I'll, I'll kind of balk at you a little bit in going through those pros and cons and just saying, let's just remember there are pros and cons. Sure. Zone, zone defense, typically giving up completions, eyes in the backfield, keeping it in front of you, rallying to the football. Man coverage, a little more disruptive at the line of scrimmage, turning and running with receivers a little bit blind to what's going on in the backfield. So more susceptible to not finding the ball down the field, more susceptible to quarterback runs, more susceptible to obviously man beating concepts like picks and rub routes and things like that. So, you know, without going too into the weeds of it, it's just understanding everything has pros and cons. And this zone coverage of the Colts, we've already kind of, you know, touched on. 
they've kept it in front, prevented some explosive plays, but I just gave a very big red flag. They've allowed the worst completion percentage over the last two years combined. So how does this work properly? And how is this a quality defense with all that being said? Yeah, I think to me, um, one of the things that stand, this was my big takeaway, just watching the cut up. And this is mainly towards the interceptions. You know, look, they had 15 picks this past year, uh, over 16 games. So they were picking the ball off at a pretty high rate. And one of the one quality, basically one thing I tried to chart was, all right, on one pl- on each play, was there a an individual trait that showed up to me time and time and time and time again? And one that showed up a lot with these guys in the back seven, at corner, at safety, at linebacker, instincts in zone coverage. And I think that there are, there's two prongs to that because I feel like so often we just said, we just throw a guy, you know, and say, Oh, good instincts, good instincts. There's two things to this. There's number one, there's an understanding of knowing those weaknesses that you pointed out, right? Hey, we're playing, we're playing a, a cover, a version of cover two. We're playing a v- version of quarters. We're playing a version of cover three. The other team knows we're likely to be in a, in this kind of coverage, right? They have an idea that, Hey, every first and 10, we like to play cover three, every third and long, we like to play cover two. So they're going to bring out their two beaters. They're going to come out and say, okay, this, these are the concepts that we want to run that are good against this coverage. You as a defender, have to have a good understanding of what that is, uh, what those plays are that they're likely to run. And then you can kind of bait them into throws. Hey, you know what? They're trying to run me vertically down the seam. I'm a Mike linebacker. They're trying to run me vertically down the seam and then hit a dig behind me. All right, well, I'm going to run down the seam with my eyes, understanding that there's a dig coming and now I'm going to break early on this throw. And I feel like time and time again, there were so many examples of plays. Rocky Sin, Julian Blackman, Darius Leonard. Just go down the list. Kenny Moore where these guys were making big time plays in zone coverage, understanding how the, the opposing offense was trying to attack. You know, and as a defense, when you come out with a kind of limited defensive playbook, that means you're coming out with the same scheme, you know, traditionally a lot of zone. So you're very much understanding how you're being attacked each week. And when the Seattle Seahawks were in their heyday of, you know, making back-to-back Super Bowls, they played so much single high, cover three on a down-to-down basis. They all had an understanding on how offenses were attacking them. And I think when you have a limited defensive playbook, that means the ways the offenses are going to attack you are going to be limited. So if you have that good understanding, um, I think it just puts you in that much better of a position to maybe anticipate action by the offense. Yeah, I, you know, being having a obviously we talk about terms like spatial awareness and things like that, but just the ability to understand route concepts and route breaks. I mean, you talk about that from a man standpoint. Hey, I've got eyes on my receiver uh, at this depth or with this release or inside or outside this kind of leverage. This is the route he's going to run. Having an understanding, you know, kind of seeing the forest through the trees and saying, okay. You know, this is a three by one set. We're in cover two. This is probably what they're running out of this three by one set. I need to be ready for this route and I need to break on it early. Uh, It's a trait that's very, very valuable for these kinds of teams. So uh, that was certainly one thing that stood out to me. Now, uh, getting to those takeaways for us, was there one play in particular that kind of stood out to you that best encapsulated what you were seeing? Yeah, absolutely. And that goes perfectly at your last point there because there were so many examples of zone instincts or second reaction zone coverage, where you have to read something initially and then react and read something else. Um, Whether you want to call that zone matching or coverage matching principles, they were excellent at it. And you could go right to, you know, rock your sin against Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers in a cover two, kind of bumping number one, allowing it to, to pass off on a little shallow cross. And then drifting and sinking on the corner out coming his way. It was a great kind of visual of the bail and react combine drill that they unfortunately got rid of. But they have the cornerback come up like you're biting on a run fake or biting on something shallow quick game and then bailing and finding the ball. It was to a T the drill. And then you go later in the season, Kenny Moore, while he wowed us with the one handed interception. It was how he got there against the Raiders in that low red zone. He's over number two. Number two, I think, runs an inbreaker. He then sinks on the corner route by number three. The safety was in no man's land looking at the quarterback, but Kenny Moore, the nickel, knew to pass off two to the linebacker and then re-sink on three, going to the corner, and he wowed us all with the one-hand interception, which I think actually took away from how he actually three, got yeah. to that position because all the highlights, you then just see the super slow-mos of the one-handed, which was outstanding. But both of those are what I call second reaction zone coverage, where you're initially reading, 
reacting and then reading something else. In zone coverage, you have to do that. You're reading route combinations, you're passing things off. Um, and I thought those were two really good examples. There was another one, you know, the Xavier Jets Ro- game. Xavier Rhodes. Yeah, I was just going to bring no that No question. One up. Yep. And that one was a little bit of a kind of a busty coverage. Yep. But in the same principle and that he was trying to pass something off. I don't think the other corner got the pass off assignment and then re-sunk on his initial assignment. But same kind of thing. I wrote that one. That was what I call a bust bail. Yep. Where you're initially almost busting the assignment. He looks open. And then you kind of bail and then steal it again. But uh, the two, Rocky Sin and Kenny Moore ones, definitely were the visuals. And you know what stood out to me about that Xavier Rhodes one is that the Jets were running a bracket or a, 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 a banjo beater. You know, they're, yep. they're, they're saying, okay, you guys are probably passing this off. We're running a concept to beat the pass off. And Rhodes knew it. And he felt right. He fell right into uh, where that second route, that corner route was going. It was, it was awesome. That was an awesome play. That actually wasn't my play uh, that I was going to uh, come to the table with. Mine was, I think it was one of the first ones that I watched. It was like the third or fourth play in the cutup. It was Julian Blackman, his interception against uh, the rookie quarterback, Joe Burrow from the Cincinnati Bengals. And it was a three by one set. Uh, I'll post the play on Twitter, but um, they had a good bre- pressure scheme up front, but really, I mean, Burrow was able to get this off from a clean pocket. Really what I saw was just outstanding zone discipline from Julian Blackman. They were playing uh, in kind of a quarters look. It was like a four deep, two under kind of look and coverage. Really well disguised. Yeah. Really. Yeah, really. It was really good Although across the board. There were a lot of really good things uh, schematically that I liked uh, about this individual play, but he was lined up Blackman to the one receiver side. So once he realized that there was no threat on that side of the field for him, he gets his eyes back towards the number three receiver and they're running a concept. They're running basically a version of the dagger route uh, where he's got a receiver screaming at him on a cross country uh, route coming across the field and he jumps the route. It was just a great job of him understanding, okay, here's my initial key in this coverage. All right, there's no threat here. Let me get my eyes back to the opposite side of the field. And he jumps the throw. You can see the ball skills at the end. Uh, I mean, just it was just an awesome play uh, by the rookie safety. And I think that there was just an example of, of one of a handful of plays. You've, you've already highlighted a couple of them um, that you, know, you just showed off that zone awareness that we were talking about. I feel like you know one of the – we've talked a lot uh, in the past about like quarters coverage. So many big plays given up in the NFL on a weekly basis with quarters coverage. I'm a big believer in the fact that if you are a team that majors in these kind of coverages and, you know, if you major in quarters, uh, you know, if you major in, in cover two and cover three, that's where the, that's most effective. If you just kind of like dabble in it, that's where I feel like the bus happened there. Cause you don't know how the, the communication isn't always there. You don't always quite have the, uh, the amount of reps of seeing how teams are trying to attack you. But when you play it all the time, now you've got everybody's kind of in lockstep together. Uh, you see that communication, you see those pass offs, and you see that route recognition. And I thought Blackman uh, just crushed it on that one. That was awesome. Yeah, that play, that was one where I said afterwards, like, where did he come from? That was, they showed single high pre snap, crowded the line of scrimmage. It looked like pressure man to a take. Yep. Yep. So Burrow figured he had to get the ball out. He was one less in pass pro. And all of a sudden they rotate to a quarters look. I was like, where did that come from? Uh, but that was a great disguise, kind of a simple disguise, but really confusing the rookie quarterback. And the quarters coverage, giving those safeties run responsibilities, eyes in the backfield, triggering downhill quickly. You have to start taking away the quick inbreakers, the RPOs, the shallow crossing routes, the intermediate crossing routes that have been torching the NFL the last five years and start saying, we dare you to throw the post over the top. What's the higher percentage play? The quick throws, the inbreakers, the RPOs. Defenses are getting shredded by the quick passing game. Yep. Now it's coming back and saying, we're going to allocate more resources into the shallow part of coverage. We dare you to throw the post over top. It's a lower percentage play, but obviously the results are going to be that much more deadly. Sure. Let's get into some of these players because uh, you mentioned there's a, a, the guys at all three levels that you can kind of point to. Was there one in particular uh, that stood out most to you when you went through all these highlights? No. In just a collective sense, Fran, there was nothing personnel-wise, player-wise, execution wise, that was finesse about this defense. No, definitely not. And when you have that type of profile, it really is interesting in how they generated some of these turnovers and how physical they are. And they don't play a lot of man coverage, right? What do you typically get with man coverage corners? Usually a little thin, maybe undersized, more speedy, traditionally, maybe a bad tackler, undersized speed rushers. Typically a little poor against the run, a little more finesse-like. 
they have a front four with Danico Autry at 280 off the edge. And the other side is Muhammad, who's like 275. And then Justin Houston comes in, who is, you know, nothing finesse about the way he plays. In the corners, you have Rakia Sin and Xavier Rhodes out there. Big, thick Kenny Moore at nickel. There is nothing finesse about this defense. And I think particularly when we watch the fumbles, these guys rally to the ball and are physical, violent, aggressive getting there, all with long limbs. They love flowing to the football. But just in a collective sense, how they play, what they're looking for, there is nothing finesse about this defense. And I think that the the, the Jimmys and the Joes kind of fit the X's and the O's of what they're looking for on this defense. And l- listen, Rocky Sin was a second round pick. That type of player is not going to be for every scheme. And hearing Chris Ballard talk about what made them so kind of infectious to him, you know, that senior bowl week and the combine into the draft process that fit the Colts and what they wanted. And it's just fun to look at the kind of profile of the full defense. Yeah. To me, like the guy that, well, cause one of the things that I, I did, I kept a column for, okay, who ended up with the turnover, right? So who got the interception, who recovered the fumble, you know, that kind of thing. But then the other column I put next to it was who forced it. Who was the guy that was the engine behind the turnover? So was it a a defensive lineman who forced an errant throw? Was it, uh, you know, a corner that tipped the ball and then it it fell into the linebacker's hand? Something like that. There was one guy on this defense who led in the turnovers created and the turnovers forced. Which Who do you think that player was? You know, I'm going to cop out and say Darius Leonard just based off of his nucleus position and linebacker. So I feel like He's made some plays of the numbers, plays turning and running, plays, you know, on the quarterback blitzing, plays rallying to the football. So my cop out would just be the nucleus player of that defense. All right. So I'm looking to see where Darius Leonard ranked. He uh, would he finished with two turnovers. He had uh, I think he had two fumble recoveries. Um, He actually he did create a a handful. But the guy who led was uh, Kenny Moore. And okay. to me, uh, you look at Kenny Moore, and it's honestly, I would have guessed Julian Blackman. I would have guessed Julian Blackman, Blackman was next, and dude, but, Black, Blackman was up there. Blackman was yeah. definitely up there. Um, but dude, Kenny Moore, he is like if you look up to 2020, what does a slot corner need to look like? That like that's Kenny Moore. Competitive, he can blitz, he can tackle, he can cover. He's got great instincts. He can play the ball. Listen, in the air. Fran, this this era of the undersized nickel, like that third corner, yep. is over. Is over. Forget it. If you're not in run support, if you're not physical on perimeter, you know, uh, yards after catch and the screen game out there, you're not playing anymore. Yeah. I'm calling that guy my third safety now. Kenny Moore looks like a safety. That guy is rocked up. He's thick. Um, he has to contribute in run support. And, you know, he is a physical, violent player. I think that's the new mold. So, like, there was the play, I believe it was against, it was against the Packers, right? Or no, it was against the uh, the Raiders. They threw, like, a little bubble screen uh, out in his direction, and he splits the two blockers out in the perimeter, and doesn't he's not able to wrap up and finish for the tackle, but you just see him poke the football out, get the ball on the ground, create the turnover. You saw this time and time again where with all these guys, and you talked about it, was how often they were just rallying to the football. Darius Leonard had a great one down in the red zone. I forget which game it was, but uh, it was a catch. The the receiver's heading towards the end zone, and here comes Leonard from the opposite side. uh, You know, high-impact tackle, gets the ball on the ground. All these guys rallying to the football, trying to get it out. uh, You know, that's that kind of personality. That's the identity of this defense, and you saw it time and time again. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the the individual trait, you know, that I noticed standing out Mm -hmm. from this group is kind of the same thing, and it's, you know, so many people want to talk about ball skills and blitzing and, you know, different exotic schemes getting to the quarterback. They have some fun stunts and twists and games up front for those four man rushes. But we rarely ever just want to talk about tackling for him. Mm. This is an excellent tackling team. And when you look at some of the players, listen, maybe everybody didn't want Kenny Moore because he lacks some twitch and coverage. Maybe some people didn't want Kari Willis out of Michigan State because he didn't have, you know, uber athleticism. Xavier Rhodes isn't a corner for every scheme. What do these guys all do? They're willing participants in tackling and getting to the football. You only get 11 out there. Everybody has to contribute. And it seems like they're all on the same page. And I love seeing the backups come in, whether it was TJ Carey out there yep. or Kari Willis, like they talked about, whoever it is. They all played with the same style and they were all on the same page with what their roles, assignments uh, and kind of, you know, personality is out there. And I just love that everybody fits. That's the one thing I love about how Ballard 
has constructed this roster, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. There's nobody that's a unicorn. There's nobody that to figure out how to work into the scheme. Everybody fits in. And I just love seeing the profile kind of mesh and be so seamless. I think Ballard's done an outstanding job in getting the players he wants for his system and his scheme. Yeah, I mean, you hit on it. And to me, like that, when I, you said, who was that? What's that individual trait? You know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, competitiveness, urgency, violence, like, that's this team to a T. That's that defense to a T. Uh, so it's a, it was a, a really fun group uh, to be able to study. The, the last one I've got for you is the, the burning question we always wrap this up with. What's one thing that you feel like you noticed that I didn't? And then I'll do, uh, I'll do yours. Uh, you already stole mine. Mine was fumbles by the second man to the ball. Nice. So okay. I, I love seeing the rallying to the football, not assuming that the one-on-one tackling is going to be you know enough. And a lot of times that second guy is either going to finish the ball carrier or maybe go poke that ball out. Mm. Um, but one other thing as well, there's a lot of long limb players on this defense. And yeah. when you watch some of those fumbles, just poke in, whether it's the Darius Leonard, Danico Autry, you know, rushing the quarterback. Buckner yeah, a couple. You know, DeFor- yep. yeah, De- DeForest Buckner's got a little length to him, so I've heard. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that front seven, there's, there's just some long limb players. And sometimes mm. it's just a couple inches that just seem like it pokes into the ball. And it's like, Where'd that inspector gadget limb come from? And they all have that same profile. So length, nothing finesse about them, rallying to the football, tackling. I mean, the last 15 minutes, Fran, this is a boring defensive conversation, tackling, zone coverage, rally to the ball. This is how you play dominant, technically sound defense in 2020. It's hard to play defense out there. Don't make it harder on yourself. Do the fundamentals. So the uh, one thing that I feel like I noticed that you didn't was the amount of a gap pressure that I noticed that this is not a high volume blitz team, but I feel like there were a, uh, a decent amount of TT stunts on the interior where they're using both those defensive tackles to play off each other. And then also there were two or three uh, pirate stunts. So three man games where you've got a guy looping from the outside and coming inside. And to, so to me, uh, you know, you talk about, um, you know, different ways to try and impact the quarterback. And, you know, we talk all about, you know, double A gap blitzes and things like that, you know, the, the ways to try and get guys from the second and third level with speed right into the face of the quarterback, they find different ways to do that. But a a lot of it had to do with some of the movement pieces they had up front. So whether it was with those double tackle stunts um, where those guys are crossing face or uh, whether it was with those three man games where you've got defensive ends or linebackers looping from the outside over the edge out into the center, into uh, the, the a gaps in the middle of the the offensive line. Uh, I thought that that was something that really stood out to me uh, as well. Um, One other quick aspect of this. A couple of these turnovers, I think there was like four or five. I feel like you would say like, oh, that's a lucky, that's a lucky play. You know, they didn't do anything to kind of earn it. And there is a certain amount of turnover luck that's required. I think if you look at uh, the teams that lead, you know, you lead the league in turnovers, you're going to have some of those plays where the ball bounces your way. I think there were two, you know, fumbled snaps, uh, one by Aaron Rodgers in the gun. There was another by, uh, I forget who the quarterback was, but it was under center. Like you're, you're going to have those. But I think that the, if when you consistently play that way, I know Jim Schwartz used to say that all the time is like, if you play play a certain way, those turnovers are going to come. It's just a matter, of, you know. Sometimes uh, you know you got to kind of get the ball rolling. Uh, that did not happen for this Eagles defense this year. They were one of the worst when it came to creating turnovers. But uh, you're going to get some of those. Some of those are, are going to bounce your way at some point. You know, I saw those and I try to make sense of them and maybe even overanalyze them at times. Right. I noticed there was three or four botch snaps by the offense, and each time Grover Stewart's over the center. Right. And it just makes you think, is there a little more urgency by the offensive center that, you know, he has to kind of react to it and maybe the, the exchange isn't as poor. There was a lot of drops for him that yeah. turned into inter- interceptions. Yep. But me trying to make sense of it is a lot of those are created because those back end players have their eyes forward. They're in zone mm-hmm. coverage. So when you're in man coverage and there's drops through the receiver's hands, a lot of times the other players are in man coverage and they're not looking. So the fact they're in zone coverage and their eyes are forward, whether it's in the backfield or rooting, reading through routes to the quarterback, that puts you in better position to be opportunistic when there's an errant throw, an overthrow, a dropped, a tipped up ball. So while we can kind of point to, yeah, you know, there were some gimmies and the offense had some boneheaded plays. What did we what did we talk about, Fran, to start this? We're not going to make the mistakes. You are. And we're going to be in position when you do make that mistake. And I just love that they don't do anything exotic, but it's just a slow burn to say, 
you know, it, are you going to be the ones that create the big play or are we going to cause it? And it's not going to be on us. And it's just really fun to see how that style of defense works. So let's bring this now big picture into to why we felt like it was important to look at this defense. And uh, look, this is obviously uh, def- the de- new defensive coordinator here in Philadelphia, Jonathan Gannon. He was the defensive backs coach there in Indianapolis the last three years, uh, working under Eberflus. And now he's going to bring uh, you know his defense here to Philadelphia. Now, who knows? The, the, here's the thing is that I think a lot of people will say, oh, Colts defense, Colts defense, Colts defense. We don't know. This is Jonathan Gannon's first time uh, as a defensive coordinator. Not only did he work under Eberflus in Indianapolis, but he was an assistant coach under Mike Zimmer in Minnesota. Uh, before that, he worked under Jerry Gray as a, as a lower level uh, assistant in Tennessee. So there are multiple veteran coaches that he's going to be pulling things from. Um, so with that in mind, you know, just looking at the, what we saw from this Colts defense, are there aspects of what they do that you're excited to see potentially incorporated here in Philadelphia? How do you see that transition going, knowing that it's not like he's just pulling from this Colts defense? No, I think it's an exciting proposition of kind of knowing who he's worked under and some credible guys like a experienced Mike Zimmer and a Jerry Gray out in Tennessee. But I think it's also an interesting unknown and in that the defensive backs coach doesn't come in and say, this is the scheme we're running to the defensive coordinator. No, he falls in line under the umbrella of the scheme. So he may come in and say, I know we ran X, Y, and Z. I'm actually all about A, B, and C. So it's going to be interesting to see what he pulls from based on his his experience. And if I had to guess, it's going to be a little bit of everything. And that's what the best coaches do. I think you grab the best aspects of your coaching experience, your different, uh, you know, mentors over the years and what works, what doesn't work and constantly evolving. Um, I think those are the best young coaches that find a way to kind of uh, add a little bit of each to the pot. Yeah, and chances are, you know, if they, if, let's just say that he was, uh, hey, we're going to come, we're going to run exactly what we did in Indianapolis the last couple of years. We're going to do exactly that in Philadelphia in 2021. I can tell you, more often, more likely, it's not going to look the way it looked in Indianapolis last year. It takes time to get to that point, to have that kind of comfort uh, in coverage, that kind of trust uh, in your teammates. So, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, that period where you're trying to working to get to that level. And especially uh, as guys are trying to get accustomed to a new scheme, I think that's uh, something important to kind of keep in mind as well. Um, I'm, I'm excited just to see some, you know, when you look at some of those combo coverages, uh, some of those things that we saw uh, from the Colts and we've seen them kind of around the league is, you know, Hey, they're going to play, uh, you know, one coverage to this side, another coverage to that side. You're going to see more pattern matching and, uh, you know, guys acting like they're in man, but they're actually in zone. They pass off or a, a receiver and then they, and then they sink and get under this throw, uh, vertically down the field. I'm excited to see some plays like that because, um, you know, obviously this past year in Philadelphia, heavy, heavy man coverage, very easy for it. it I'll put it this way. It's, we, we break it down time and time again. We break the same thing down every single week. So I'm excited for you and I, when we're doing our weekly breakdowns, something new to break down and try and teach our fans about and try and, uh, you know, the, you, know you do your doodles and we break it all down. That's always fun to me. It's like, oh, that's, it's something fresh. It's something new uh, to give the fans and, and dive a little bit deeper. Because honestly, that's an area of the game where I'm trying to learn more about and trying to like button up the details of, of what my understanding is uh, of the game. So being able to watch that more consistently, have a better, better understanding of how def- defense Defenses are trying to play against those kinds of looks. I'm excited for that aspect of it. It's a deep, beautifully complex game on a player level, on a scheme level, on a positional level. There's so many layers. There's a lot of football to, to watch out there. There's so many conversations we can go in different directions. It's the beautiful thing about this game and so many different layers to the analysis. So next week, we are going to stick on the defensive side of the football. And what we're going to do next week is we're going to watch all of the sacks from 2020 from the top three sack artists in the NFL this year. That's going to be TJ Watt from Pittsburgh, Aaron Donald with the Rams, and Trey Hendrickson with the Saints. And what I love about this too, Ben, is that you've got three guys that did some different things. Obviously, you've got Aaron Donald, who's playing inside as a defensive tackle, TJ Watt, uh, a 3-4 outside backer who lined up on the defense's left side, and then Trey Hendrickson was hand in the dirt defensive end, a lot of sub-package work. He lined up as a right end and a 4-3 scheme, so he's looking at the other side. So we're going to see guys coming from different alignments, trying some different things. I'm, uh, I'm excited to kind of dig into it. So we're going to look at all the sacks from those three players from the 2020 season. It'll be fun. All right. Yeah, that's a fun assignment there. Where's Hendrick- Hendrickson from? Is that FAU? FAU. Yeah. I, that's I was right. Big, I, was a big, right. I was a big Hendrickson fan when he was coming out. So I was glad to see him have a uh, interesting a profile experience. of bodies on that Saints front there. Marcus Davenport and Cam Jordan and Rankins and 
Uh, I think Hendrickson was obviously the uh, the winner of the 2020 sack totals. We'll see how many of those he created himself in there. That's something we'll definitely be taking a look at uh, as we do this film study over the next week. But uh, Ben, this was fun. We will uh, we'll talk to you later this or next week, but we'll talk to you later this week uh, here on the Journey to the Draft podcast as well. Great stuff from Ben, who you can follow on Twitter, just like I do, at Ben Fennel underscore NFL. And while you're at it, I'm at Eagles XOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's Nose content that we produce here at Eagles Entertainment. And you know I greatly appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on all forms of social media. That's one way to support the show. But the best way is to go on to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating, and leave us a comment. I want to give a shout-out today to someone who did just that. Beast 57 boy 57 left a five-star review saying, Hey, Fran, Miles Sanders is my favorite Eagle. Could you do a segment about him and just what he brings to the table? Maybe compare him to Saquon Barkley since they both came out of Penn State. Love the podcast and everything you do on here. Please keep it up. So uh, it's a good question. And Miles certainly had a, a really interesting year. His second year in the league, there were some ups, there were some downs, right? He fought through injury again. That's going to be something he needs to continue to try and find ways to be more durable. And I think when you look at his ability to create the big play, I think you look back uh, on some of his big runs this year. When they gave him a clear runway, when they were able to get him up to the second level, he did some great things, right? I mean, so those two long runs against Pittsburgh, against Baltimore, where it was basically they were third and long draw plays, but those draw plays are meant to suck the defensive line up, get the running back with a, a full head of steam up to the linebacker level. Once you're able to do that with Miles Sanders, that's where he, the, that's where the magic happens. He's able to make people miss. You could see that breakaway speed, and I thought that he was able to show that on those kinds of plays. Obviously, they got he's got to get back on track in the pass game, and that's something I'm really interested to be able to watch uh, here with this new offense. Uh, obviously, under Nick Sirianni, under Shane Steichen, finding ways to be able to get him the football. When you look at both uh, Sirianni and Steichen, really a lot of these coaches, where they come from, they were able to feature the running back, right? You go back to to Indianapolis, and you know they were able to get Jonathan Taylor. I think he had more catches this year as a rookie than he had in his entire career at Wisconsin. But you know what they were able to do with Naheem Hines, and you go to Sandy to the LA Chargers, and what they've done with Austin Eckler over the last few years. I think they're going to find ways to be able to get Miles Sanders the football in space as a pass catcher. I think that will do wonders for him as well. Because again, I want to try and get him in space as often as possible. I thought he ran harder as the season went on. There was a strike a stretch there. Mid- year where he wasn't running maybe the injury had something to do with it he wasn't running quite as hard as you would expect but I thought he really bounced back in the second half of the season and was really able to kind of lower his shoulder through contact run a little bit harder behind his pads uh, to try and pick up some of that extra yardage I thought he did a nice job on the back end of the season and again to me it's all about trying to find ways to get him in space I think when you compare him to Saquon obviously separating uh, the school they came from. I mean, Saquon is just kind of a freak show in terms of how he's built. Guys that are that, are that big should not be that explosive. It should be against the law uh, for guys to move the way that Saquon Barkley does. I think that's the difference. I would say the similarity between the two is kind of their running style in terms of, uh, I would say that they're, you would define both, especially coming out of Penn State, both guys were what you would call run-to-daylight runners, where they're trying to find as much space as possible, and they're going to try and get there. You know, early on in his career, I think we, with Saquon Barkley, you would hear the coaches try and say, look, we, we want him to try and get more of those dirty yards. We, he needs to be able to learn how to pick up some of those, you know, grinding yards on, uh, you know, it's first and ten, we need you to pick up four. Don't always go for the home run. And I feel like that's something that we've seen from Saquon. Obviously, Obviously, he was hurt all of last, for the most part of last year. Uh, so hopefully, we'll see more of him moving forward. But that was really uh, the kind of the knock on Saquon Barker because from a physical standpoint, it's tough to find anybody uh, to match what he has brought to the table. So, uh, Beast Boy, I hope that was a, that was enough to, to answer your question. Thanks so much for the support. Thanks to all of you as well out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcasts here at Eagles Entertainment. That being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Duffy House, I am Fran Duffy. We'll talk to you next week. In just over three years, Eagles Autism Foundation has raised millions of dollars for autism research and care. But this is about so much more than just fundraising. This is about making a transformational difference in the lives of those affected by autism. This is about bringing our community together. With inclusive, sensory-friendly events and accessible resources, we meet families where they need us most and where we can serve them best. Together, we're united in our mission to improve the lives of the autism community and to turn awareness into action. It's what we focus on every day in every way.